join me in welcoming to Bowie State University our county executive. I am so thrilled to be here this morning with the ladies of Bowie State University. In fact, I almost have to apologize for showing up a little early, but I was so excited. Uh, I actually do have a flight to catch uh, this afternoon, but aside from that, I just couldn't wait to get here. Uh, to be surrounded by all of this power and uh, all of the gifts that you possess. And so I'm really thrilled. I was so honored uh, to have been invited here this morning. So I want to thank Dr. Bro. So much uh, for the invitation this morning. We are so excited about her and about her leadership. Uh, and so I want to thank her for being the visionary that she is. We, we didn't have Women's uh, History Month presentations when I was in college. We really didn't. And so we have come quite a ways. And she said something um, that was so true. She said, you know, we didn't have as many women in leadership uh, at that point. And so uh, women in leadership it certainly does matter. Uh, and I am really thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled about the topic this morning, Unapologetically Me, uh, and the power of her story. I hope I've said that correctly, but uh, I just love the theme of this morning because it is difficult, I think, for any of us to consider our own stories without rem remembering the sheroes uh, who are throughout our stories. I think every one of us, even those who feature prominently, some of us have sheroes who were behind the scenes, uh, but in every single story, there is a shero somewhere. Uh, this has certainly been the case for me. I would literally not be here, but for the women I have encountered along my journey. Some of them I was related to, some I just happened to come to know along the way, but there are sheroes throughout my story. Uh, so I'm honored to begin by just sharing at least three of them with you. Uh, the first is my great-grandmother. Uh, Maybelle James, she was a super bad woman, born in, uh, and she, in that she was born in 1897. Uh, she lived in a place called Seneca, South Carolina, with my uh, mother and other family members. And on July 4th of 1956, while in Seneca, her husband was murdered. Uh, he was murdered by a sheriff's deputy, and he was left to die on the side of the road. Uh, and in fact, as you understand what South Carolina was like back in that day and time, there certainly would not have been any justice for her or for our family. And in fact, uh, what the family was told is if you don't leave, we'll kill the whole family. And so she had to make a courageous decision. And by July 19th, literally 1956, my family moved from Seneca, South Carolina to a place called Fairmont Heights, Maryland, right here in Prince George's County. Uh, and so Maybelle, a woman who I was very, very close to, uh, who was just so wise in so many ways, and I could just spend a lot of time with her. And in fact, she lived until my first year in law school, uh, and she imparted to me over that time so many uh, pearls of wisdom. She was a quirky woman, uh, kind of like me, and, uh, and she was a really uh, huge impact. She had a huge impact on my life and was a huge presence for me. Uh, reminds me as well of another woman um, who didn't have a cape. Uh, when we think about sheroes, but was certainly a woman of power, and it is my fraternal grandmother, whose name was Sarah Daisy, and so she raised uh, my father and his two siblings, and uh, had her brother, and they lived in a one-bedroom apartment uh, on Benning Road here in Northeast Washington, for those who know that area. Uh, but what is remarkable about Sarah is that she really wanted to elevate her family. She was working uh, cleaning hotel rooms. She was there. Uh, as a maid in the local hotels, and she wanted to um, to work in the federal government. This was her dream. And so she put on the refrigerator in that one bedroom apartment uh, a piece of paper with a keyboard on it. And she was so brilliant that she taught herself to type on the refrigerator in her kitchen, went on to pass the civil servants test, and she retired from the Pentagon, uh, working there uh, as an administrative assistant. is one that empowers me. And then finally, uh, when I think about the women whose shoulders I have stood on, and as I've said again, there are women all around us, uh, whether we know them or not, uh, whose shoulders we stand on every single day, who created not only the example, but forged a path for us so that we could be here. And I think about my own mother, um, who I love so much, we are super close, and um, 
parts of her are woven through my story as well. I was reflecting and I was sharing with some of my colleagues about my mother and how well I think she communicated with me as a child. Um, I think she did a great job in spite. She was 21 years old when she was married, she and my dad. Uh, she, I call her a cougar because she was 21 and he was 19. I tell you, she, was uh, she swept up this, uh, this younger man. Um, so she's a person who helps me, who has helped me to evolve. And I say the word evolve because we are the sum total of our experiences. I begin to, I understand this more and more as I go along how we are, all of us, evolving. Every day I'm still evolving. I just turned 48 and we're still evolving. Um, but my mother is a person, when I think about my own evolution, who helped me in a very powerful way. And I wanted to share this story with you. I was looking back on some photos. Uh, and this was several years ago. And I looked at a photo of me. It was in the summertime. I was probably six or seven years old. And I was standing at Hershey Park, amusement park in the summer. And uh, my sister was standing next to me. She's two years older than me, so we really grew up uh, together. And I'm pictured, I had on a turtleneck, it was like July, <laughs> and a turtleneck on, I had some shorts on, and I literally, I had knee socks, like covering my knees, and, uh, and I'm standing, you know how little kids do that, I'm smiling really hard, and I look so happy in this photo, and next to me is my sister, who has on a tank top, <laughs> shorts, and ruffle socks. And so you all know where this is going, right? And so I said to my mother, well, you know, what, what is going on in this photo? Why did you, I'm accusing her, why did you put me on that turtleneck? And she said, girl, if only I could tell you. She said, this was just what you wanted. And she said, I came to understand that at some point I would just respect it. And she said to me that, uh, she said, you came here and you had always known exactly what you wanted. And she said, you were this way your whole life. You came here and you knew exactly what you liked and didn't like. And there was nothing we could do about it. And so she said, on that day, she decided to honor me. And, uh, and so you appear in your turtleneck. <laughs> And then she said, you know what, I decided to just keep going. <laughs> me. And I respect her so much um, as I've had an opportunity to look back on the way that she raised me, to respect me even at that age, and to understand the thing that each of us must understand. And that is that we are equipped early on in life with traits, with whatever we need for our journey. We all are destined for a different journey. And you will be equipped with whatever tools you need, personality traits, flaws, whatever it is to help you along that journey. Yeah. And so she knew and respected very early on that where I was headed in my life and the plan that God had set aside for me would require some quirkiness. It also would mean I was a little stubborn. It, mean, it meant likewise that when things got tough, I had to be able to trust my own instincts to know exactly what I liked and didn't like and what I believed. But it was important for her as a parent to see that in me early and not to try to suppress it or to try to get it out of me, but instead to recognize, you know what, there is something there. And this is what she's been given. And let's go ahead and develop it in her to give her the confidence around it and to allow me to stand there smiling broadly in my turtleneck. <laughs> and so I say to all of you that this is what we should remember is that we were born with special gifts and special traits. When we talk about our own stories and, and being powerful, recognize that the power was given to us the first day that we got here. And the true challenge, I believe, of each of our lives, and I have found this even for myself, is to spend the time that it takes to come to know what that is. Yes. I think the beauty of it is that we don't have to wonder whether it's there or not, whether we were given something special, the point of the matter is that it is our job to discover the gift that we have been given, to discover the mission that we've been put on. And I say to you what I say to most women, and it is your job to make sure you do not leave this earth until you have shared it with the rest of us. It is your job to develop it, to find it, uh, to make sure you do everything you can to protect what you've been given and that you should not leave this earth no matter what it takes until you have given it back to the rest of us. Now, how will you discover it? I think knowing yourself, again, making sure that you listen to yourself, that you trust yourself. And you know what? And I think you've probably seen it very early on. Those of you who 
were corrected. I'm sure like my mother did not hesitate with correction. Um, but drawing on a wall, we got some artists in here who I'm sure started showing that trait very early on to your family members that there was something creative in you that could not be suppressed. I have one of those people in my household, uh, my daughter, who is 13 now, and people told me when she turns 13, a whole different lady right. will show up at your doorstep. And I want you to know she's here now. <laughs> Sometimes and I think, was she looking at me like that? What was she looking at? Uh, but she is creative, and I know that some of them are even in this room. The blooming artists, those who uh, used to lick the bowl after your mom made a cake, and then found yourselves drawn to cooking. There's some people in this room with culinary skills that won't die. That. Uh, belong somewhere opening a restaurant, that there's a plan for you somewhere along the way, that there's a skill to share. There are some chemists in this room, too, who, who found themselves with a chemistry set at some point, uh, who loved really uh, discovering things about science. We have some scientists, and I know we have some engineers in this room, some folks who tinkered with and took things apart and enjoyed rebuilding them. We have some people in this room with some skills. And it is our job to find out what those things are uh, and to understand them in order to write your story. You can't write a story unless you know yourself. You can't. You must understand yourself. And you know there's value in knowing who you're not as well. And put that out there. I was a horrible math student. Uh, I try as I might. I'm telling you, I did everything I could. Lord, I couldn't understand math to save me. I could not tutor. I did everything imaginable to try to understand math, and it was just difficult for me. Uh, and so I began to understand that I had to, did that there were some gifts that I didn't have, that there were some roads that I should not go down. I started out saying I should be a physician, and then discovered, well, if you can't count. <laughs> This might not make for a great physician. Nobody wants a physician who can't count. Right? So think of something else. And so I decided I love people and decided I wanted to fight for them and, and thought going to law school would allow me to do this and would allow me, right, honestly, not to have to focus on math, right? But I discovered even as I was in law school, I was in a, a law firm. I was blessed to be hired uh, as a law clerk in the largest law firm in Maryland. I got this job my first year of law school. It was a big deal. Uh, but it's funny when I look back on it, I was assigned at one point to a commercial real estate section in the law firm. Uh, and those who know about law know that transactional law requires what? A math line. So here I am, I'm walking through the hallways of this big law firm and, um, I, and, and I'm given assignments. And uh, when I get the assignment back from the lawyer who, who was overseeing it, he looked so frustrated and devastated <laughs> at my assignment. He had read all over the paper. He looked at me, and he's thinking, good gosh, you know, she doesn't understand the assignment. But likewise, I realized that my spirit didn't belong in a law firm. I'm bopping around the law firm. I'm sticking my head with my public service self in people's offices, smiling. Good morning! I'm disturbing people because this is not... <laughs> This is the right environment for me. I'm a public servant in this place, you know, it was just not cut out for me. My skills wouldn't take me there. And I was okay with that. And so when I left there that summer, I decided I don't care how much money they pay. I won't spend my time in a place that doesn't make me jump out of bed in the morning and doesn't help other people. I decided the law firm, I don't care how much, and they paid a lot. I had to make the decision, it wouldn't be for me. And you will have to make those decisions uh, as well. And your gut will usually be right. It will. And it takes courage at times to follow it. Because I could have very easily said, but what about the money? But that's not where the satisfaction is. So accept who you are, know who you are, uh, and then surround yourself with people who will bring that out in you. This point, I have to tell you, is one that I also share with my daughter. It is so very important. I don't have to tell you already that life is not always lollipops and roses, that there are going to be some storms up ahead. If you live long enough as a part of every life, every life, I don't care what it looks like, there will be some storms as a part of your story. 
some disappointments, some things that don't go quite right, some mistakes that are made. So life is not easy. But the thing that we must make sure that we do um, is to protect ourselves with everything we have, to make sure that we are not consuming things or allowing people around us who drain us, who take from us the power that we have been given. And it happens more easily than you know. Uh, I reflect on the story that I heard. Um, there's a B Bishop T.D. Jakes. He comes each year to my church at the beginning of the year and does a leadership teaching. And I attended one of those teachings, and it was um, very powerful for him to talk about, to hear him talk about chickens versus eagles. And I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with this concept, the difference between a chicken and an eagle. Well, as it turns out, chickens eat almost anything. They consume even their own waste. They cluck around the barnyard, and if you've noticed, chickens can't fly. Now, they come up a bit, but they come right back down. Chickens can't stay airborne, but mostly because of what they have consumed. They consume almost anything, and they don't give off much. Uh, if you know about a chicken, you know that when a storm comes, a chicken will be hysterical with fear, all clucking all around that barnyard. They will, of course, try to take flight, but remember, they can't fly. They may even go in the coop, but there's nowhere for them to go. But an eagle, well, an eagle is so selective that I learned that even eagles even mate in the air. Because they are careful what they let in, and eagles mate for life also. But eagles are so selective that they even mate while they are airborne. This is the difference between an eagle and a chicken. And an eagle, when a storm comes, doesn't stand on the barnyard floor and go in circles. An eagle takes flight and actually flies into the path of the storm. They fly into the path of the storm until they get high enough to fly above it, and then they keep going. This is what we must know. It is so critically important. In order to write our stories, we're going to have to let go some stuff. Some unforgiveness. You know, everybody, again, is a part of their story. will have some tribulation. But what you keep inside makes the difference. We have to let go some stuff and let go some people every now and then who are not there to develop us in the way that we need to don't complement our journey. It is a critical truth that this must happen uh, in order for us to, to take flight. It means we're going to have to block out not only some people, but we're going to have to really block out some of this overexposure that we get. Now, I didn't have a cell phone. Again, I'm telling my age. I did not have a cell phone when I was in college. There was no cell phone. There wasn't even the internet. Uh, but what I know now is that we are so overexposed now that it is crippling us. Some of everything, you know, the, the, you just watching, beginning to watch women, for example, the discord that is displayed in some of the shows that come on television. It's damaging to watch women belittle each other on TV. You know, what, what I've heard about social media is that we have seen a 70% increase in suicide among women young women, a 30% increase among young men, but 70% among young women. And what they tell you is that young men generally use phones to play games. Young women use social media to compare themselves to other women, to compare their lives. You know, and, and anybody can fall prey to it. I look up there sometimes and say, I would love a Caribbean vacation. <laughs> Wow, she's on another Caribbean, another, another vacation. This looks amazing. But your real life and your Facebook life and your whatever other life, Instagram life, are sometimes not quite the same. And so making sure, again, that we are protective about what we let in, because some of these things are dream killers. You know what they are, right? Some of these things are dream killers, the things that distract us away from what is truly important in life. The thing that keeps your eye off the prize, like your education. Anybody who comes between you and your education is an arch enemy. You heard it here first. I don't care who the person is. Anyone who comes in to disrupt your education is an arch enemy. And I want you to treat it that way. Uh, an example of this is just last week, and the weeks go by so fast, I think it was just last week when we had the incident with the woman in Annapolis, Maryland. You know, the state legislature is in right now. And there's a woman from a county probably 100 miles away in Hartford County 
who called us a name here at Prince George. Uh, I don't know how many of you heard about this story. Uh, and I was called to go and, uh, and they said, oh my gosh, they want a comment from you as a county executive. They want to know what you think about this. We want to hear from you. And on my way to Annapolis, I was in the truck and, and literally was on the phone with my father and said, you know, I want to talk about this. What do you think? We talked about it for a moment. And when I hung up, he sent me a text message, which trips me out that he now learns to text. <laughs> he sent me a text message, and the message, he had one line. He said, don't fight people about the wisdom of feeding dinosaurs. And I thought, mm, this is deep. This guy is deep. Do not fight people about the wisdom of feeding dinosaurs. And by the time I got to Annapolis, I had my mind right. And I, you know what, what it was? On the same day that the story appeared in the Washington Post about this negative term, there was also an article that said there is a $23 billion gap in education funding between minority and non-minority children. Yeah, there was outrage on the one hand, but no outrage about this equity gap. And so what I said in Annapolis that this day is anyone who speaks, she's, first of all, she's a dinosaur. And her views of us mean absolutely nothing to us. You know what I mean? Her opinion of us means nothing to us. We're very clear about who we are, but anyone who goes to work and speaks that ignorantly and who's uninformed should either resign or be fired. We understand that. You don't get to go to work and say ignorant and unenlightened things and not be fired. But the point of the matter is this. Don't distract me. I'm in Annapolis because guess what? We have a $23 billion gap in education funding. And you know what the question was in my staff said, oh, we can't believe you said that. I said, you know what? Don't distract me. I want to know where is our money? care less what she thinks. And what she thinks on any given day won't change the trajectory for the people I represent. But if you fund their education, it will. Where is my money? I believe you also have to have, to have the same laser-like focus about your life and about the things that matter to you. And your education is cheap among those things. And you let nothing or any person distract you away from your education. It truly is the great elixir, and it's the great equalizer in this country. I want yeah. you to understand that, and I know it very clearly. But that's an example of how we can become distracted, and we have to be laser focused on the things that we are to do. And so I, find, I say just a couple of things, as I know, again, they told me you were headed to lunch, right? And you said, Lord, don't invite her again. But I just wanted to make sure I left you a few things, and I'll leave you with this final thought, uh, and it wraps up already the things that we have talked about this morning. Um, I was encouraged to read in high school. My father came home, uh, and he gave me a book, and he said, you know, go read this book, As a Man Thinketh, um, and by James Allen, and I, I certainly recommend that book to all of you, and again, I was in like 10th grade, and I thought, well, you know, I don't know about this book or not, but I'll check it out. <laughs> and essentially what it talks about is such an important thing to empowerment. It is that your thought life controls your whole life, is what it says. As a man thinketh, so he is. Uh, and so the power of how you think is so very, very important. To remain optimistic, and ladies, you have a right to be optimistic. The reason that I started by saying there is, is there's no question about whether you are gifted, whether you are destined for greatness, whether we need you, whether there's a contribution. Again, that, what did I say? You can't even, it's so important, we don't want you to leave here until you have given it to us. And so as long as you keep your thought life healthy, that you remain faithful and steadfast, I promise you that on the other side of this is always something so great. You are unapologetically you. Yes. And we can't stand for you to be any other way. And so the power of how you think is so very, very important. To remain optimistic. And ladies, you have a right to be optimistic. Yes. The reason that I started by saying there is, is, there's no question about whether you are gifted, whether you are destined for greatness, whether we need you, whether there's a contribution. Again, what did I say? You can't even, it's so important, we don't want you to leave here until you have given it to us. 
And so as long as you keep your thought life healthy, that you remain faithful and steadfast, I promise you that on the other side of this is always something so great. You are unapologetically you. And we can't stand for you to be any other way, any other way. So go forward remembering the baddest woman to have ever walked, I would say the streets of Maryland, but there were roads at that point as Harriet Tubman. Yeah. Yeah. The baddest woman to have ever walked the roads of Maryland. And she gave us those words when she said, what did she say? No matter what, don't give up. Yeah. She said, if you hear the dogs barking in the woods, don't give up. If you see a torch and a fire behind you, you don't give up. If you hear the voices yelling behind you as you go forward, don't give up. And she said, if you ever want to taste freedom, don't give up. And so I end by saying to you, no matter what it looks like, don't give up. We need you so desperately. We're waiting for you. We're waiting for you and all that you will contribute. And guess what? We're going to do it together. Together. So thank you so much again for having me today. Uh, I hope that you enjoy the rest of this wonderful, wonderful conference. I want to thank Dr. Bro and, uh, and the rest of the organizers and staff today who have put together such an amazing conference. God bless all of you all uh, and, and have a wonderful day. Thank you.